So welcome to this edition of the Halbstead Colloquium. Uh, it's a special pleasure to have uh, Professor Orzin here today with us. Professor Orzin uh, is a professor of uh, real-time systems at uh, Lund University. Of all the guests that we've had so far, I think he's maybe from the closest university to, uh, to us, which is really fantastic. His areas of expertise include uh, control and real-time systems and real-time uh, scheduling in particular. He has uh, numerous publications, over 150 referee publications or so, and uh, has uh, been responsible for uh, very influential works in the area of uh, real-time scheduling. We've been I, very lucky to cross paths a couple of times very recently in the context of a workshop that has been organized at Lund and also at an NSF CPS meeting in DC a few weeks ago. Uh, today, uh, we're very fortunate to have him talk to us about uh, the simulation of cyber physical systems. So without further ado, please welcome uh, Professor Orton. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. So the title of this, by the way, can you see me if I stand here? Yeah, it seems as if uh, this is not the optimal way to, st but, but okay. <laughs> Simulation of cyber physical control systems, uh, I decided to call this. And uh, I'll talk a little bit first in general about CPS and simulation of CPS. Then I will go into more detail on our tool called TrueTime, focus on some new features. And uh, then I'll speak about uh, uh, the current implementation of TrueTime, which is based on Simulink. And I'll run a couple of demos there. And then I will end. Uh, talking about some very recent work where we are porting a true time to Modelica. And I will also show a very brief demo there. So uh, I assume that uh, most of you know what cyber physical systems is. The tight connection between the physical world, computing, control and communication. But that is not all because that is something which one can say that that has been done for quite some time in control and in embedded systems. But to this one often adds some different characteristics like this is something that is large scale, verification validation is important, resilience and security, resource awareness, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, I won't spend more time on defining this because this has already been done by Edward Lee's group at Berkeley where they have done this taxonomy of cyber physical systems. Uh, so it includes, uh, yeah, you can see what it includes. It includes almost everything. Uh, what I will talk about here is the, the shaded areas. So this is mainly about simulation. Uh, it's about uh, uh, control systems. It about, is about real time. It is about tools and so on. Uh, so uh, CPS and control, how does that uh, uh, coexist? I mean, control has been interacting with physical plant for 100 years or so. Uh, in my mind, there are two types of control problems that fall within the cyber physical systems uh, uh, field. Uh, one is when you have a very large scale distributed and decentralized control systems that are so large scale that you want to do decentralized analysis, decentralized synthesis, uh, decentralized optimization, utilize things like the sparsity in, in, in the models and so on. And that is a, a field where our group is actually working quite a lot, but not uh, with me involved. We have Professor Anders Ranzo who is working there. The second uh, part of control that in my mind falls under CPS is uh, when you implement controllers on resource constrained implementation platforms. Uh, embedded control systems, networked control loop, uh, where you get temporal non-determinism uh, caused by the resource sharing. You share CPUs among different applications or tasks. You share uh, bandwidths between different applications. And you need robustness towards this temporal non-determinism. So we have delays, we have jitter, we have lost packets, we have quantization. And this uh, sometimes goes under the name co-design or cross-layer design of these systems. So this is uh, what my talk mostly uh, deals with or tries to simulate. Uh, so simulation, I mean, for a control engineer, simulation is something that is quite important. Uh, we always use simulation 
to, 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 to verify things uh, as a complement to formal methods. When formal methods uh, doesn't apply. Uh, uh, and if we now want to do this also for cyber-physical systems, we need simulation tools that cover both the cyber part and the physical part of these systems. So we need essentially to co-simulate uh, computations that take place inside the computers. We need to be able to co-simulate this with uh, the wireless and, and wired communication. The dynamics of the physical parts of the environment, sensors and actuator dynamics, and maybe also things like uh, power consumption. Uh, <coughs> uh, if we start with simulation of the physical systems, then I'm quite sure that all of you in this room agree that equation-based languages, they have many, many advantages over causal block diagram-oriented languages, like classical simulation for modeling the physical parts of the CPS systems. And we have languages like Modelica, we have Simscape for Simulink, we have Acumen from uh, Valid's group. Uh, and of these, Modelica is uh, the most mature equation-based uh, language of this type uh, uh, available. Uh, there are several commercial tools. The most powerful one is probably the Daimler tool from Dassault Systems which originated uh, as a Swedish uh, tool developed by the Dynasim company in Lund, which was then later acquired by the SOS systems. But there is also a couple of uh, open source uh, tools available, both of them Swedish actually. We have Open Modelica, centered around Peter Fritzen's work in Linköping, and we have uh, J Modelica, centered around our department in Lund and the company Modelon. Uh, for Modelica, the discrete time and the discrete event parts, they have recently been redesigned based on ideas from the French synchronous uh, programming languages. And this is on its way into the commercial uh, implementations in, in, in Daimola and, and so on. Uh, so so the, this, the, previously, the, the, the discrete and hybrid parts of, of Modelica was a bit... Uh, not so well defined as it should have been. But with this new thing, uh, the, the semantics is extremely well defined based on clock inference techniques. And they also have uh, support for finite state machine modelings based on something called mode automata, which one com can compare with the state flow uh, state machines in Simulink. So that is all well. Uh, but then simulation of cyber systems. Uh, the discrete parts of Modelica allow us to model discrete time controllers and finite state machines. That's fine. We can do that. We can, so to say, model and simulate, simulate the, the ideal desired behavior of a controller. But things we cannot simulate, or which it's quite difficult to simulate, is to simulate things like delays and jitter in delays caused by the resource sharing in kernels and networks. And also, we cannot use uh, the ordinary languages that we use to implement the, these things also in the model. So we cannot write our controllers in C code or, or in C++ code and, and put that into the simulation. Uh, in order to handle this, we have developed TrueTime, a simulator par, uh, tool for the cyber parts of CPS. Uh, and the idea here is to embed models of computers and networks within physical system simulators, like Simulink or like Modelica. So what we do is that we simulate real-time kernels, we simulate uh, kind of an ideal but fairly general model of a real-time kernel, supporting uh, multiple tasks and uh, semaphores and monitors and whatever. Uh, and we also simulate uh, uh, the data link layer of different uh, wireless and, and wirebound uh, uh, protocols. Uh, this has been developed in Loon since 1999. Uh, now we have version 2.0 in a beta release. We have a fairly large user base. Uh, we have around 1,000 downloads whenever we come with a new version, and it's released under GPL. 
So if you write true time in Simulink, you get this block palette with blocks corresponding to, corresponding to true time kernels, to, to networks, wireless networks, uh, and some other things. Batteries, for instance. Uh, so the real-time kernel in uh, TrueTime simulates an event-based real-time kernel and it's actually, the implementation is very, very similar to a real uh, real-time kernel. So it has everything, I mean, ready queue and, and, and monitor queues and semaphore queues and interrupts and, and everything. It's very, very similar. Uh, so this kernel, it executes tasks and interrupt handlers that you write yourself as a user. Uh, you can write them in C or C++, or you can write them in MATLAB M files. You can select which scheduling policy you should have. There is built-in support for fixed priority scheduling, earliest deadline first scheduling, and some others. But then you can also define your own scheduling policy. If you want to have some more value-based scheduling, you can use that. Uh, and then it has all the real-time primitives uh, that you find in a real kernel. I mean, so there is support for uh, Interprocess communication in various ways, semaphores, monitors, mailboxes. Uh, there is uh, support for uh, sleeping and sleeping until and, and, and uh, so on. There is support for dynamic voltage and for scaling. Uh, yeah, lots of things. Uh, the code you write is uh, algorithmic code in M, C, or C++. Uh, the problem is that the Simulink simulation en engine is uh, single-threaded, and we want to simulate multi-threaded uh, application, of course, tasks and interrupts and preemptions and stuff like that. So therefore, what we do is that we emulate multi-threading by structuring code into code segments. So here is a controller. Execution or the code is, in this case, split up in, in three segments. In the first segment, we, we sample the plant, calculate the controller output, and then we say that, okay, the execution time for this was uh, two milliseconds. We have, let's assume that that is the case. Then, in the next segment, we send out the control signal to the plant, and then we update the internal state of the controller, and then we say that, okay, this took four milliseconds to execute. And then, in the next segment, we don't do anything. We simply say to the solver that now the job, the, the current job of this task is, is, is over. Each of these segments is essentially an atomic unit. Uh, the code in it is executed atomically, but then during the, this execution time, uh, we can, so to say, have preemptions from other uh, tasks and interrupt handlers. And that is the way we, we simulate uh, or emulate multi-threading. We also have to keep track of the, of the context of each task explicitly. So one uh, argument into the, the task code is the, the context, the data, and that is also returned. The execution time can be anything. I mean, it can be uh, stochastic, uh, it can be based on something other in the model, or so on. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the wired networks uh, model the mainly the medium access delay and the transmission delay of the networks. We have models for a number of uh, predefined uh, data link layers, like ordinary switch, ordinary uh, shared Ethernet, switch Ethernet, CAN bus, uh, uh, FlexRay, Profinet IO, time div division, and so on. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I will demonstrate this uh, in a while. Then the, the wireless networks, currently we have support for two uh, uh, MAC layer policies, the ordinary WLAN and the uh, so-called SIGBI radio protocol. Uh, in addition to the inputs that we found for ordinary uh, wired networks, we also have the X and Y inputs of the different nodes that is communicating over this wireless network as, as inputs to the, to the block which of course is needed. Uh, right now we only support 3D, so we assume that this is used for mobile robots moving on the floor or something. We don't support uh, 3D, but it could very easily be extended to 3D. 
simulating wireless is, is difficult. One could almost say that it's, it's impossible. I mean, you have never any idea about uh, uh, the, the, the path loss. Uh, I mean, we, as default, we use an exponential path loss model. I mean, very, very simple. If you want, if you have some more detailed model, uh, modeling, sorry, fading or, or multipath propagation and so on, you can plug it in to the system. It's possible, but uh, it's not the default. Uh, some uh, new features of this. Uh, we have support for simulation of kernels with multiple core. So each true time kernel may have multiple cores, so we m may simulate uh, uh, more than one task executing at the same time, so to say. Uh, it is partition scheduling, so each core has its own ready queue. So we have a primitive for defining the number of CPUs or cores of a kernel, and we have a primitive for uh, deciding which core a certain task should execute within. Then recently we have also added support for bandwidth servers. So bandwidth servers is uh, essentially a, a way to virtualize the hardware. So you have virtual processors, um, uh, and where each virtual processor can be seen as uh, a slower uh, processor. So in this case we have split up the physical core into four pieces, one executing at 10% of the speed, one at 20 and so on. And this is nice because it provides temporal isolation between the tasks executing within each virtual processor. So we can, we can uh, have primitives for creating a, a CBS, setting the budget and the period of the CBS. We have uh, primitives for attaching a task to a CBS and we have primitives for uh, adjusting the budget and, and period dynamically during execution. Okay, so that's true time in general. Then true time for simulating, how does that work? Well, these kernel blocks and network blocks, they are simply as functions. So, and the code, they are written in C++ uh, following the, the S function interface. Uh, the task code, either, as I said, C or C++ or or the M file script language of, of MATLAB. So uh, now I'm switching to the first demo. It's a demo of how one can use TrueTime in the networked control applications. Uh, so I will do that right away. So, here we have the model, it's an ordinary simulank diagram. Here we have the physical plant that we are controlling, a simple uh, server model. Here we have a true time kernel, so a CPU, that is acting as the I.O. interface. So here we do the sensing of the output of the servo, and we do uh, the actuation, so we send the control signal to the servo. When the measurement signal has been sensed, it is being sent over a network. So here is the network model. It is being sent over the network to the controller node with a control algorithm, a simple PID is executing. And then when the control signal is available, it is being sent on the same network back to the sensor actuator node where it will be sent out to the plant. Uh, here we have an interference node that just uh, sends interfering traffic on the network, just to see how, how, uh, how, how uh, sensitive it is. So let's uh, simulate this. And let's have a look at this. So here is the classical thing that control engineers usually look upon. Things like step responses, so the, the, the response is a, a square wave, and this is the output of the servo, and we look upon control signals and so on. So that's the classical things that you use Simulink for. But then in addition to that, you can also look upon uh, uh, the schedule of the controllers. So in this case, uh, in the IO node, we have two tasks. One doing the sensing and one doing the actuation. So, and they run perfectly periodically. There is no 
no, no, nothing strange here yet. We can also look upon in the, in the controller node, we have the controller schedule here, like this. Also perfectly periodically. And we can look upon the, the network schedule. We can look upon the different nodes, when they are sending, uh, when they are uh, not using the network, when they have had a collision and they back off and so on. And in this case we have two nodes utilizing the network. It is the IO node that sends the measurement signal to the controller node and it is the controller node that sends the measurement signal back to the uh, IO node. The control signal back to the IO node. Okay, uh, now let's uh, say that uh, uh, we want to investigate how sensible this is for interfering tasks in the, this kernel. By switching an initial parameter here to 1 instead of 0, I have set up the demonstration so that now there will be a high, frequency, high, high uh, priority task executing uh, in this uh, controller node. Uh, disturbing the, the controller uh, code. And if you remember from last time, now it looks a little bit more oscillatory here. And uh, if we go in and look upon the, the schedule for the controller node, we can now see that, uh, okay, we have something very uh, periodic and regular here. That's the high frequency, high priority task executing here, and here we have the controller task that uh, is sleeping, and then here, for instance, here it wants to execute, but here it is uh, preempted by the high, high priority task, and it's not until here it executes. So, so this is then, uh, we have quite a lot of interference on this task from the high priority task. Then we can, uh, in addition, uh, uh, also add some interference traffic to the networks. So let's now say that this interfering uh, node generates traffic corresponding to 20% of the uh, bandwidth of the network. And then how, how will this uh, influence? Okay. There's something bad happened. So you see it, it has to do with how and when we have collisions on the network. The network, by the way, is an ordinary shared Ethernet here. We can have a look upon the network schedule and see how it looks like. So, uh, uh, yeah, you can see here, here is something weird happened. So we had uh, collisions and, 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 and back-offs and possibly also chained back-offs. Uh, who knows? Probably. That's why we ha got these very long, uh, long, long things here. Okay, now let's instead see what a better protocol could do. So let's, uh, let's switch from uh, Ethernet to a uh, CAN network. Okay, and then simulate again and see how it looks like. Now it looks much better because CAN is much more deterministic than shared Ethernet. We can now see exactly what, how this influences the, the control performance. So this is one type of, of, of simulation experiment you can do with true time. Probably the most, uh, most common one from uh, the user's point of view. The reason I do clear all is that there is currently a bug in the system I'm running. <laughs> I have a 64-bit machine. Uh, the this was developed for a 32-bit, and we have some problem at some point. But so therefore, I need to do this clear all now and then. Okay, but uh, that's life. Okay, uh, another type of thing you can do is simulation of different wireless robotic uh, systems. Uh, here we have uh, two soccer teams, the red team and the blue team, playing soccer. And each of the players is a small, uh, small uh, robot. Uh, so here we model the... Uh, the kinematics of the robots, we model the radio communication between the players, uh, and we model the, the movement of the ball, and so on. So, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's run this.
so let's see so here we have the oops that was the bug <laughs> strange 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 uh, okay I will I have I have some time so actually Real software. Yeah, it's not. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a canned demo. Exactly. I thought we should have Halmstad playing with against Sundsvall, but <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. That's why it's crashed. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, one more game to play. Uh, okay, so I will start. Uh, uh, I'm going to start MATLAB again. Actually, I won't, I won't uh, do this. So. Uh, no football game today. Okay, I'm going to continue with uh, one of the largest and most realistic uh, models that we have developed. Uh, also involving mobile robotics. Some years ago, we were involved in a European FP6 IP uh, called RUNAS, coordinated by Ericsson. And this was on, on mobile communication in general. And in that program or project, we had a fairly large demonstrator, which was uh, uh, based on a scenario uh, related to uh, safety in a road tunnel in the Alps. So you have a road tunnel equipped with uh, both a stationary uh, sensor network, wireless, uh, wired sensor network, and a wireless sensor network. And then you, you have some accident, you have fire, you have uh, cars crashing, and uh, uh, the stationary sensor network goes down. Uh, and you need, uh, at, at least partly, so you need to restore connectivity, and you do that by sending in mobile robots that will act as mobile gateways for restoring the connectivity. And we did a mock-up of this, so we actually had these robots running around on the floor and we had real uh, European Commission officers and real firemen in the audience looking upon this, and, and it actually worked. So, uh, uh, in this we need localization. We need to localize the mobile robots, and we had a system based on ultrasound. So the mobile robots were actively sending out ultrasound pings at the same time as they send radio signals. And in the passive stationary nodes, we uh, measured the difference in time of arrival to, to measure the distance from the mobile robots to the stationary sensor nodes. And the stationary sensor node then sent that back to the robot. The information and the robot fused together all the measurement using an extended Kalman filter, where it combined the sensor measurements from the ultrasound with the um, wheel encoder measurements. Uh, so, and, and then we had the robots. They were, each robot, mobile robot, contained five microprocessors. It had an internal I2C bus for the communication. Uh, we have the sensor network radio communication based on the WLAN uh, data link layer, and on top of that we had an AODV uh, route routing protocol, uh, ad hoc on demand distance vector routing. Then we had ultrasound based localizations, we had to send out ultrasound and model that. We had infrared based obstacle avoidance, which we needed, and we had the control and estimation of this on top of that. So we had quite a lot of different things. And the question was, how should we verify the functionality and timeliness of this? And the idea then was to use true time. So in parallel with implementing this in real, we implemented a simulation model in true time for the different things. So here is how the model looks like uh, from a top level. You have different uh, r r mobile robots, you have uh, stationary sensor nodes, six sensor nodes, one being the gateway to the rest of the uh, internet, and uh, these inside the tunnel. These sensor networks can be turned on and off. Uh, if they are turned on, well then they are active, working, participating in the transmission of sensor data from the tunnel, and participating in the ultrasound localization. These sensor nodes, they look like this in reality. 
So it's an ordinary uh, black box. Inside the black box there is a T-mode sky. And then we have a special ultrasound uh, uh, receiver uh, developed in, in, in our group. The mobile robots, uh, they uh, look like this in reality. We have five uh, Atmel AVR uh, mega process, me mega, uh, microcontrollers here. Uh, and then radio and ultrasound networks and animation. So here is uh, the inside of one of the mobile robots. Here we have one T-mode sky responsible for the radio communication and also acting as the bus master for the ITC bus and doing the robot control. We have one larger AVR Mega 128 acting as the uh, compute engine, acting as the interface to the infrared and implementing the Kalman filter, the navigation and the obstacle avoidance. We have one special Mega 16 as the ultrasound interface, the I2C bus. And then opening up this, we have the wheel and motor submodels uh, inside. Uh, and here we have, for each, for each wheel, we have one Mega 16 microcontroller. And then we have some simple uh, motor models. And then we have a dual drive unicycle uh, kinematics uh, for the robot. And then we have an animation. And uh, let's hope that we don't have any uh, bug right now. So, uh, Okay, why is it so slow? Okay, here it is. So uh, we can open up this, uh, this one, look under the mask, and here we see the different models. We can open up the robot uh, dynamics, and uh, uh, here we have this simple, simple model for this. Um, uh, we can start simulating. So here we have the, the, the tunnel. And right now, this is the entrance to the tunnel and this is furthest into the tunnel. Here we have some sensor uh, measuring some temperature or whatever. And this is then transmitted using multi-hop like this out to this one. And we can see that this changes and eventually very quickly we get the same value here. Now I will turn off uh, this one and this one, I believe. Turn off these nodes and have a look upon what's happening with this, uh, this value out here. You see it, it fades away. So now we don't get any, any data in here. Uh, and uh, what do we do then? Well, we send in the mobile robot. Uh, so now we see the mobile robot. There is an obstacle. We have to avoid the obstacle. It's a very stupid obstacle av avoidance algorithm. Very simplest you can think of. Oh, there is an obstacle. I have to turn. Oh, now it's free. No obstacle. Oh, then I can turn back. Oh, there is an obstacle. So it's very stupid. You also see that there is something black and something gray. The black is the true simulated robot. The gray is the internal model that the robot, where it believes it is, based on the extended Kalman filter data fusion. So it's, it's fairly OK. And now it has soon avoided the obstacle. Seems a bit stupid, more stupid than normal today. And uh, eventually it will uh, reach some position here. And then the connectivity will be restored. The multi-hop communication will now uh, act uh, Okay, not always, evidently. It should have, it, what should have happened was that this should have been uh, 
coming out here. And uh, all times so far I have simulated it really does, but uh, it's the demo effect again. Uh, what should have happened is, is really that, uh, but uh, I don't know why. There is, there is stochastic in, in this, of course, so, so maybe it was. Yeah, that was probably the reason. So, so what happens if I turn on? Uh, I, I turned off the, the. Yeah, if I turned on this one, now we had the communication again. And if I, yeah, yeah, one can play around with this. Okay, so that was a fairly uh, realistic uh, model. Uh, now, I'm going to. The demo was done, and now I'm switching for, for Modelica work. So we are, are, are porting this uh, to Modelica. The network part has actually already been ported. We were a part of a European project a uh, couple of years ago called Eurosyslib. And in that one, we developed a native Modelica version of the network part of, uh, of TrueTime but only the networks. And we did that in two versions, one native Modelica and one using external C code for, for Daimula only. But now we want to have full true time in uh, Modelica. And we base this upon the flexible mock-up interface. A new standard for model exchange and co-simulation that has been developed within the Modelica community the last couple of years. The idea is to have an open source, non-proprietary model exchange format. You can think of this like S functions. It's essentially very similar to S functions, but S functions are proprietary and can essentially only be used within Simulink. This is the same thing, but it's open source and not owned by anyone. Uh, there are two, uh, two, two, two versions of this. One is the model exchange, where you uh, can export uh, models only. So you can have this as a flexible mock-up unit. Uh, that you can, can, can export and import into other tools and so on. And then you have the co-simulation uh, version, where you also can uh, export uh, a solver. So you essentially have a, a module containing both the model and the solver, which you then can, can control from external, externally. Uh, and this is what we are basing the implementation on. So, and we are basing it, it on the model exchange F FM, FMI uh, version. Uh, so the kernels and the networks, they are flexible mock-up unit, units. That means that we can essentially use any simulation tool that supports FMUs, Daimola, or the open source tools. We can also use any other non-Modelica tool that embraces FMI. The task code is written in C, and this is not completed yet. This is work in progress. We do it in collaboration with Vanderbilt University in, in Tennessee. Uh, it's Professor Janusz Stefanowicz's group. Uh, they are involved in a very large DARPA project called Adaptive Vehicle Make, uh, AVM. And the idea with this program is that they should uh, uh, have uh, some kind of maker community building uh, uh, different uh, uh, military vehicles to the U.S. Uh, Army. One can discuss if this is something good or bad, but anyway. Uh, we are part of that as a subcontractor to uh, Vanderbilt, and TrueTime will be used as a part of something called the Meta or Meta2 toolchain for cyber-physical systems. Mm. So I'm going to finish this with a short demo, because this is very much work in progress, and I cannot demonstrate very much. This is uh, the Daimola tool. Here I have import imported a kernel containing a very simple uh, PID controller, well not even a PID, a P controller, pro proportional controller only. I'm simulating a physical plant that is an integrator and the, square the, the, the reference signal is a square wave coming like this. So it's essentially an extremely small control loop, but this is a true time kernel written in, uh, in, in C. So I can now uh, I can now uh, simulate this. Actually, I have simulated before, but we can simulate it now. Okay. It's it's it's. Uh, so this is just the, the square wave, and this is the the reference signal. And uh, we don't know exactly right now why it's so slow. It's something some development, but it, it, is, uh, it is right now doing something. I don't know what. 
Okay, there it's finished. So uh, we can look upon the, the input to the integrator, the output from the controller, like this, and we can look upon the, the schedule. There is only one task in this simple uh, system, and we can have a look upon that task. And it runs uh, perfectly periodically like this. So it's essentially the same thing you saw before, but much, much uh, simpler, based on the FMU ID. Okay, uh, so let's round off this. Uh, simulation of CPS, uh, even more important than for convention conventional controllers, I would say. Uh, and what our approach is to do co-simulation of the cyber parts and the physical parts. Uh, and the idea behind TrueTime is to embed models of the cyber parts within physical system simulators like Simulink or, or uh, Modelica-based simulators. Maybe in Acumen, I don't know, but uh, one could think of it. And this is just some references. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Thank you very much. Yep. So, um, simulating things are interesting, but uh, only as long as the simulator is doing what, uh, what, what is intended in the, in the real world. So, uh, how, how would you validate this? Is it, is it possible to, for instance, to run in your, uh, in your C code your tasks? Is it possible to run the same code in real hardware as there is in the simulator, or is it... It is, it, the, the code that we run in the simulator is not exactly the same code. It's slightly instrumented, but it's still, it, I mean, it's still the same C, C++ code that you have to split up in segments. You have to replace the uh, real-time primitives with our true-time real-time primitives. But apart from that, it's uh, fairly similar, I would say. Uh, here is some, some words about validation of true-time simulations. Uh, the validity of using true-time for simulating wired network application was, has been evaluated independently uh, from us by uh, University of Leicester. It was some while ago. Uh, they did uh, CAN-based automotive cruise control applications and they compared the true time results with a hardware in the loop test bed based on VxWorks and the results were actually very good. This is what they wrote and we didn't have any idea uh, on, on this, so to say. So, so they, they claimed that this was a very good way of doing it. And they use it for the students. So they have student projects where they should implement a real, real CAN-based based, uh, system. But before they are allowed to use real hardware, they have to simulate it use, using TrueTime. But then, of course, as soon as you come to wireless network simulations, then you, are, you can be completely wrong, of course. I mean, it's very difficult. You have all things of, uh, of, of, of effects that are extremely difficult to, to model. Our idea is, I mean, we want to have something that model the most important uh, phenomena, but we cannot model all the detailed phenomena. And that is, so to say, the, the general philosophy. For instance, when we simulate all the networks, we never simulate the propagation delay, because it's infinitely short. Things like bit stuffing in CAN, we completely ignore. We don't essentially send the messages on a bit level. We just send an arbitrary MATLAB or, or Modelica structure, and then we say that, okay, the sending of this takes a certain amount of time. So, so that's, the, that's the general idea. If you want to have something more uh, detailed network simulation, you should, of course, use something like NS3 and integrate that with Simulink or with uh, Modelica. And it has been done by others. So. Okay. So when, when you simulate very complex uh, cyber physical systems, I guess you get a very complex uh, amount of data back. Is it a big challenge to to visualize the simulation? Yeah, of course it is. So how we, do you deal with we, that? We have mainly done this for this mobile robotics, and then it's quite natural to visualize. I mean, you have mobile robots moving around, but in general, I mean. I have no good ideas on, on how to visualize uh, things, really. Uh, I'd like to come back to, to your question, actually. When we did this, uh, this thing here, uh, part of the code was exactly the same. The extended Kalman filter and the robot controllers were exactly the same code in the simulation and in the real AVR uh, uh, processors.
switch between the atom levels to be able to cook a large system? So would you just that, that's a problem, I would say. I mean, this is simulation on a fairly low abstraction level. We are kind of modeling at almost the same level as in the real implementation. Of course, one would need to have higher abstraction layers and combine multiple uh, layers and so on. We don't do that yet. But of course, that's very natural. Have you thought about uh, also simulating energy uh, behavior so that, if, for instance, if you were to have uh, mobile robots running on battery, that you would do it? Yeah, we can do that. We have battery models. And with that we can charge and discharge uh, based on anything essentially. And we have the dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. Uh, so we can, uh, we can uh, model the power consumption of, uh, of the CPUs and so on. So that, that we can do. But of course, it's very, it's, the, the battery model is just an integrator. <laughs> so. Yeah, sure, sure. A lot of people have actually added their own protocols. We have, we have an, people at ABB have implemented support for wireless heart in true time. Uh, and there are some other groups also that have implemented other stuff. So it's possible to do. Any other questions? I had a quick question about the modelic integration. I yep. This is kind of like uh, heating and uh, but I was encouraged by the fact that it was through the uh, FMI. Yeah. And uh, this kind of relates to your suggestion at the end, I think. It would be good for us to build the connection between Acumen uh, here and uh, FMI yep. to benefit from uh, yeah. things like the interface to... Uh, I mean, I think FMI is a, is a very good idea, to have an open, non-proprietary S-function kind of standard. Uh, because if you think about how, how uh, MathWorks use S-functions, uh, I mean, they don't really use S-functions as a way of exchanging models between different simulators because there is only one simulator and that's simulating. What they use S-functions for is for extending the modeling power of Simulink. So using S-functions, they have uh, the toolbox sim events that uh, implement discrete event simulation. They have simscape that do equation-based. They have state flow. And also we use true time uh, use based on S-functions to extend the modeling power. And one can do exactly the same thing in using FMI inside Modelica. You can use it to extend the modeling power of, of Modelica. So speaking of the kind of the, the leading edge, if you can go back to that example, um, can you tell us a little bit more about how uh, one can modify the true time when you're using Modelica or a little bit more about how the integration between the two works from the user's point of view? Uh, I mean, the code that you write for your tasks and your interrupt handlers is written in C, C, C. So that code is fairly small, and that uh, links in the model for the true time kernel. And I would do that in uh, my favorite editor. You would do that in your favorite editor, and then you would build uh, an FMU out of this. And then you would import that FMU using... Uh, uh, Import FMU. All the yeah, and then you get it in the left-hand uh, explorer, and then you drag it in and connect it and compile and run. Yeah, Perfect. that's the idea. But of course, it's not complete yet. So <laughs> the thing is that uh, uh, we have a joint with uh, Vanderbilt, and uh, Vanderbilt has hired a Swedish guy from Lund for doing this under our supervision. And, and right now, Vanderbilt, they have a very tight uh, deadlines, and uh, they have some quite difficulties with uh, Modelica. Uh, I mean, the whole idea is to take high school kids and let them model advanced systems using model libraries. And you, we all know, I mean, uh, index problems, uh, initialization problems, I mean, how, how, how on earth will that work? It won't work in reality. I mean, Modelica is a very powerful tool, but it needs very skilled users. I mean, modeling, uh, modeling mechanical systems is not easy. It's difficult. Physical systems in general is difficult. Uh, and then also they have the problem of uh, that by DARPA they are forced to use open source tools. So they are not allowed to use Daimler. They have to use open Modelica or J Modelica. 
And of course, neither open modelica or J modelica is as advanced and complete as Daimola, so they have big problems there. They have uh, two um, uh, component model component developers utilizing uh, using the the, the multi-body library from Modelica. And uh, Open Modelica cannot simulate all the parts and so on. So, so right now, uh, Vanderbilt has hired uh, Modelon in Lund to develop uh, more simpler models, uh, multi-body models and so on, vehicle models, that doesn't make use of any of the fancy multi-body stuff in Modelica. Easy models that can e be easily be and efficiently and fast be, be simulated. So. Sounds very challenging, but it sounds like it will also be very good for open modality. Yeah, yeah. So, so that means that this, which is kind of on, on the next layer up, is kind of uh, postponed somewhat. So we'll see what happens. Eventually, maybe we have to do it ourselves. But <laughs> Sometimes it's necessary. Yeah. Any uh, other questions? Perfect. So uh, uh, now we get to the present thing. So you might know about this tradition of having a present for this. Small thing, not the university. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.